I want to welcome everyone to our program today for Southwestern Law Day. My name is Lisa Gear, and I'm the Dean of Admissions at Southwestern. I'm here in my 23rd year, so I think I know a thing or two about Southwestern, um, and I'm so glad to see all of you here today, um, you know, and really appreciate you spending a little bit of your Saturday with us from wherever you are. We, we know we have some folks very near and some very far. Um, and uh, you are all very, very welcome. So today we're going to kick off our program with hearing from um, the Dean of Southwestern, Dean Darby Dickerson. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her and then she's gonna kick us off. Um, and then we will go then into our mock class. And then we will hear from our distinguished panel on um, the value proposition of externships. So again, if you have questions throughout the program, you are welcome to put those in the chat. And then of course we will have um, the formal periods of Q&A as well. Um, so also joining us today are going to be our ambassadors or admissions ambassadors. So if I could ask each of you to also say a quick hello in the chat and introduce yourselves so our guests know um, a little bit about yourselves as well. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So Dean Darby Dickerson is the president and dean um, and a professor of law at Southwestern Law School. She formerly served as dean and professor of law at UIC John Marshall Law School um, in Chicago, um, Stetson University College of Law, Texas Tech University School of Law, and the John Marshall Law School. A nationally known leader in legal education, uh, Dean Dickerson is the immediate past president of the Association of American Law Schools. She's an elected member of the American Law Institute, a past president and current board member of Scribes, the American Society of Legal Writers, and a former director of the Association of Legal Writing Directors. D Dean Dickerson received her BA and MA from the College of William and Mary and her JD from Vanderbilt Law School. She clerked for the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and then practiced commercial litigation in Dallas, Texas. In 2018, she received the AALS Section of Legal Writing, Research, and Reasoning's Lifetime Achievement Award. She has also received a variety of awards for her professional, charitable, and community service. Since joining the Academy in 1985, Dean Dickerson has taught legal writing, pre-trial practice, and election law, and has directed writing, externship, journal, and advocacy programs. She writes in the areas of legal citation and legal and higher education. Um, Dean Dickerson joined us this past summer, and I want to say just what a pleasure it is to have um, her leadership at Southwestern. I can tell you firsthand just how committed um, she is to the success of all of our students, um, again, both near and far, um, and it's my pleasure to welcome her this morning. So, Dean Dickerson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean Gear. Welcome, everyone. It's so great to see so many of you with us from so many places across the country and the world. I want to be among the first to welcome you to our herd. We are the bison. So um, I'm hoping many of you choose to become permanent members of our herd. But for today, you are part of Southwestern. This is an amazing place. As Dean Gear said, I've been here four months now. This is the fifth place I've had the honor of serving as Dean. And it is an incredibly special place an incredibly dynamic place. As you can see from some of the icons on this page, we are a top school for entertainment law. We are an incredibly diverse community. We have top programs in a variety of areas, including advocacy and litigation, family law, international law. We send competition teams across the country and they come back with more than their fair share of victory. So there is a lot always going on in our community. Southwestern holds a very special place in the California and particularly the Los Angeles legal community. As we were talking about as a ramp up to the formal program, we had the first night program in Los Angeles. We have a ton of first. You can see just a small snippet of our first on this page. The, her very first graduate was a woman, and she be, went on to become the first female public defender in the nation. We had the first black female appellate justice in the nation, the first Chinese American federal district judge in the continental United States. So Southwestern has always been a place 
that welcomed people who had the ability and the desire to practice law, regardless of what they look like or who they came from. And those people in turn have gone out and really transformed the face of the city of Los Angeles, for example, our alum, Mayor Bradley, who Tom Bradley, who served for mayor for 40, uh, this is the longest serving uh, mayor. We've had mayors serve for 40 total years representing um, our great school. Um, they've changed the face of legal practice. We have alums who are doing cutting edge litigation, who are in government, who are leading public service organizations. So we are a school that really prides ourselves on being able to give back and serve this wonderful community of Los Angeles. I am so sorry that we could not host you today in our wonderful facilities. This is a shot of the Bullocks Wilshire building. It is one of our three buildings on campus. It was a former department store and it's on the historic landmark of register of buildings. We have taken a lot of time to really restore it and it is just an art deco masterpiece. This building includes classrooms and a lot of faculty offices, our tea room, with is, which in non-COVID times is a gathering place, our law library, our fitness center, and so much else. We also have another building, our Westmoreland building, which includes classrooms and a lot of administrative offices, some faculty offices, and of course the residences, which include our student apartment. So it really is a fantastic environment in which to study law. Another thing that Southwestern prides itself on is its flexibility. We really try to meet students where they are and give them a variety of options to complete the JD degree given their circumstances. So we have a traditional full-time program and most of our students are in that program. We have a part-time evening program, which is now hybrid. So some evenings you come to campus, some evenings you take your classes online. We actually have two part-time day programs. One is designed especially for people who are parents of younger children and they need to be home in the afternoon so they can take their classes in the morning. The other one is more flexible that you need to take your classes essentially during the day and you can mix and match your times there. Dean Rolnick is here and she is the Dean of the country's first two-year JD program. You'll see other schools advertise that you can complete the JD in two years, but that just means you're going through on your own and taking classes year round. Here we have a very deliberate program on a special schedule and you go through as a cohort and it's a very tight knit group and they go on to be personal friends and professional colleagues for their careers. And we also have some ways that you can put together a dual degree such as our JD MBA program. Now the beauty of a JD is that it's a general degree. So once you earn that degree and pass the bar exam in the jurisdiction where you choose to practice, you can decide to practice whatever you want or in multiple areas, or you can decide to start in one area, maybe criminal law and decide a few years later, you'd like to shift in bankruptcy or family law. So our JD is that general degree. We have required courses, but you have the opportunity to take courses throughout the curriculum, but some students have a passion and they know exactly what they want to do. So we have developed six concentrations where you can marshal your elective credits and sort of get a head start in that area. And we're considering more areas as well. We're also a school that is about hands-on experiential learning. From the very first semester, you're going to be able to get in there in our laws classes, our legal writing classes, and do things that are akin to representing actual clients. And then as you move through our curriculum, we have a tremendously varied and successful externship program. And we have multiple in-house clinics. So what's a clinic? A clinic is where you get to serve as the lawyer representing actual clients. And we also have a variety of community service and public service projects. So you can get involved as deeply as you want to 
in the actual practice of law and working with actual attorneys throughout your time here. This page shows the statistics for our class that just started this past August. We started with about 380 students. And here you can see the breakdown on the top of the traditional day versus students versus scale versus part-time day. You can see that we are 51% racially and ethnically diverse. More than 40% of our students are first gen students. So we understand this and we put a lot of support around our courses. So we're not just gonna drop you in the classroom. We're gonna make sure that you have the tools succeed to succeed in the classroom and outside of the classroom. We draw people from around the country and around the world. We're slightly more female than male. And you can see that we have a wide range of, of ages in our student body as well. Now, as I mentioned, and I'm sure as some others are going to address in more detail, we do have a rigorous required curriculum. And this really prepares you not only for the practice of law, but to pass the bar exam. And we're doing very well in our bar pass statistics. And you can also see that our scale program has its own curriculum. So you're not just fending for yourself, you are with a group that moves through in a very deliberate way. And although many aspects of our curriculum look like other law schools, we have things that are very unique to us. For example, our academic support and bar preparation program, which begins in the first year with the foundations of law and practice. This gives you a background on how to approach law school, how to study for law school exams. It allows you to begin developing your professional identity. Another unique thing is the fact that in your first year, you can take an elective. That's pretty rare. Most times you don't get to take an elective until maybe your third semester if you're a full-time student, maybe not until your fourth semester, but this allows you to pick an area and start exploring it and determining how you want to build the rest of your curriculum and the direction of your career. When I interviewed for this position, I was just taken with the professors here. They are amazing. They're smart, they have a varied professional background, and they care. They care a lot about the students. They work a lot with students outside of the classroom. They're always thinking about creative ways to engage students in the curriculum. And they're just an amazing, amazing respectful collegial group, the best I have worked with. And so I'm very, very pleased to be able to say, come here because you want to study with our professors. And again, they think about ways to integrate the practice of law into the doctrinal classes. So for example, this is a picture of one of our professors, Isabel Gunny, and she integrates actual practice sessions, courtroom labs into her evidence class, which is amazing. You don't see that at every law school. And our professors are on the cutting edge. They are in the news. These two items are just from the last couple of days. We had one professor quoted extensively in the New York Times. We had another one featured in an article in The Hill. Um, professor Van Landingham is a former military officer and she does a lot in terms of national security and military law and criminal justice and things like that. And these are just a couple of our faculty who were featured this week in the media. We also offer unique programs that are adjacent to our curriculum. For example, the director of our writing center has launched a storytelling project. Now think about it. Lawyers are professional communicators. And most of the time we're expected to persuade. And what persuades better than a good story? So we take the time to provide programs for our students and our alums on how to improve their storytelling skills. I attended one of these programs just yesterday with our alum and someone who's also a professor. He runs our trial advocacy program, Joey Esposito. And he really did keep me on the edge of my seat wanting to know more about his trial techniques. And our alums really give back to help us create unique programs. So two of our alums, really excellent trial lawyers, 
Brian Panish on the plaintiff side, Wally Yoka on the defense side got together and have created a new fellowship program for students finishing their first year where you get to do an externship with a defense litigation firm and a plaintiff's litigation firm during your first summer with a stipend. Again, I haven't seen anything like that at another law school and I'm very excited to work with this community to continue building innovative programs like this. And going back to the idea that we don't just toss you into the classroom and let you fend for yourself. We build a lot of support around you. So not only do we have people in our academic support and bar preparation program who will guide you through learning how to approach your law school classes and exams and that ever important bar exam, but we have an outside psychologist who works with us. So you have access to a counseling center. We have a wonderful career services department that will help you plan out your job searches and plot steps that will put you in a competitive position to get those first jobs. Just this past week, we opened a food pantry on campus. We know that some of our students and employees potentially suffer from food insecurity. And if you're hungry, you cannot focus and learn. So we try to provide those resources that will allow our students to succeed. We're in the final stages of launching a professional clothes closet. We pride ourselves in placing students in externships and a lot of our students have part-time jobs, but maybe you don't have enough professional clothes to go out four or five days a week into these settings and, and feel comfortable and powerful. And so we want to give you that resource as well. A program that I'm about to launch for graduating students is called Bridge to Practice. There's simply some things that you don't get in the law school curriculum. There's so much to learn when you're becoming a lawyer. So I'm gonna take five or six of these topics that I didn't know about, and I went out and made mistakes and didn't know how to do them when I was a, a new attorney. I come from a single family household. My mom was a, a secretary for a state agency. I didn't come from a family with lawyers. I didn't know lawyers. And so again, I get it. I get that you're trying to not only be the best lawyer, but to be really a business professional and you need those skills. So some of the things we're gonna cover are how to really make a great first impression at your first job. We're gonna talk about the economics of law practice. We're gonna talk about dining and event etiquette and so much more. We also have programs designed for Specifically for first generation students, we have a wellness program that includes um, staying healthy mentally and physically. And we have just a wide variety of student organizations. So you can find your niche, you can find your group. And then we're always bringing excellent speakers to campus and different programs to campus. So again, like I, I said at the beginning, this is a dynamic place where you're going to be able to find your fit and to really excel and achieve what you want to. And I'm just sharing this final slide with you. These are the employment statistics from the class of 2020, the pandemic group. And as you can see, we, we did very well with that group. It's actually, our stats are a little higher. A few of the, the people had jobs, but they couldn't start after the deadline. But you can see, you can go to law firms and public interest and business and government and so much more from Southwestern. So we're so excited that you joined us today to learn more about us. We hope that you will consider us. There's Dean Rolnick with her scale, scale group that you, you come with us and that in a few short years, this is going to be you. It is now my pleasure to introduce an excellent professor, Professor Christina Knowlton. She was here at the beginning for the informal part of the program. She received her BA from UC Irvine, her JD from the University of Texas. Um, she's a, a Texas licensed attorney, as am I. She practiced in San Antonio. She's also taught at Texas Tech and at Laverne. We just missed each other at Texas Tech. She teaches legal writing courses and she is 
an award-winning first place national champion coach of our negotiation honors program. So it is my honor to turn the program over to Professor Knowlton. I'm going to stay in the chat for a little while. So if you have some questions for me, I'll try to answer them in the chat. Thank you again for joining us today. Thanks, Dean Dickerson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Southwestern. Hi, Alejandra. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Valerie. Hi, Roxana. Hi, Amber. Hi, Armin. Hi, Chenyarai. I'm going to go with that. I don't know if I drive that right. Chenyarai. It's okay. Chenyarai. Okay, Chenyarai. Well, well, this is going to be an interactive class. So I've got to get your names down because in law school, we get called on. So are y'all ready for that? I, I want to try to encourage, let's see, um, Patsy and Marie and Momo and Jade and Savrit and Sarah, Paul, Morgan. Can we get any more cameras on? Don't you want to be here for your first law school class that you've ever had? This is it. This is laws. This is actually your first law school class. It's not next year. So you got to turn those cameras on. And for my sake, please, let's participate. I saw, I saw a lot of engagement as Dean Dickerson was talking, so I'm excited. I can tell you're present, you're here, you're ready, and I'm ready for you and all of your ideas. And what I'm going to tell you is this is a safe place. When you get to real law school, you know, maybe professors might be a little bit harder and expect something. I expect nothing. Like this, you don't, you haven't started one day. So all answers are right. No matter what you say, it is right and it is good and there is not a wrong answer. So I need you guys to loosen up a little bit and get ready to be a lawyer because today we are going to be a lawyer for the first time, okay? We're gonna practice an actual case today. So before we get started, um, let me share my screen. Hold on. I think I'm sharing the right one. You guys see something that says Southwestern Law School and it doesn't have, it's just right here. You see my mouse going around? Okay, great. Okay, good. So as uh, Dean, Dick, uh, Dean um, Dickerson mentioned, I am a professor. I teach legal writing. I teach negotiation. I've taught property. I've taught contracts. I've taught mediation. I've taught a lot of different classes. Um, I got to say legal writing is one of my favorites, probably my favorite. It's hard to say that with negotiation. They're tied, um, which is why I teach both of those. But the reason I like legal writing so much is, one, it's the most important class you'll take in law school. So if I could give you any advice just from right at the beginning, legal writing isn't just another writing class. It is what you will do as a lawyer. It is heavily tested on the bar. It's what you're going to do no matter what area of practice you go into. Um, so take it seriously. Because if you ask any of our students, hopefully you'll get a chance to talk to them. They will tell you after they've done their externships, that's the number one most important skill are the skills you learn in this class. So I like having the best class. It's kind of fun to be the one with the best class. So I like it for that reason. But I also like it because I love to change people's mind. I don't know how many we can get a show of hands. How many people are a little bit nervous about writing? Feel like maybe I'm not the best writer. This, the thought of taking a year of writing scares you. You can use your virtual hand if you didn't turn your camera on. Anybody a little nervous about writing? Or are we all confident? Some nerves, we're pretty confident. Well, I'm gonna to talk to these people who have a little bit of nerves. Denisha, thank you, good, <laughs> Savrit. Um, legal writing is nothing like any writing you've done before. So I'm gonna get my next slide up there. Um, if you think of yourself, I'm a good writer, I've got this. You got to reopen your mind because legal writing, some would say, is not even writing. It's almost like a fill in the blank form. It is so structured and so different than anything you've ever done that I don't even classify it as writing necessarily. The good news is for those who think I'm not such a good writer, I've always kind of struggled in writing, this is your shot. It is new and different and everyone's on the same playing field and everyone's learning something new and it's not like previous writing. So what I have found is that students who come into me at the beginning of the semester and say, hey, you know, writing is not my thing. I'm really nervous about this class. Those are the ones at the end of the semester that say, this class is awesome. I actually am a good writer. I never knew I could be a good writer and you will be. You will be a good writer. 
And you don't have to have a strong writing background to succeed in laws. So just come in with an open mind. I put this on my slide because I want you to visualize that. You are a writer, whether you think you are or not, and you are going to be successful in laws if you just open your mind, let go what you've known from the past, and be open to a new idea, a new way to write, okay? Because legal writing is very, I'm just going to make sure, Jenny, you didn't have a question, right? Your, your hand is up from before. I just want to double check because I will take questions if people have them. Oh, yes. I only put it up because I was worried coming from a very academic background, um, having to be very clear and a lot more, more focused. So that was my concern. But now um, I'll go ahead and put my, my hand down. Thank you for addressing Love it, me. Jenny. Right. Yeah, it is very focused. It's very detail oriented and everything has to go in the exact right spot. It's like a recipe. I want you to think of this. Most of you have cooked something at some point in your life. I'm not even a chef. I don't actually enjoy cooking, but I've done it, right? We've all done it at some point. And when you get a recipe and you're like, I have to make this dish, whether you enjoy it or it's more forced upon you, what do you want at the beginning? You want ingredients, right? Uh, you gotta know what to get at the store. So we all know if you see a recipe, you're going to see something like this with a set of ingredients of everything you need, half a tablespoon of this, three eggs, half a cup of milk, whatever it is. And then you're going to get a list of instructions and how you put those ingredients together. Imagine if your mom handed you a recipe and said, hey, I need you to make me some sweet potatoes for a Thanksgiving dinner. And it didn't look like this. And instead, it just said, you know, sweet potatoes are one of the best dishes. I really love sweet potatoes and they're moist and they taste really good. And by the way, get some eggs. Um, and we're gonna serve 20 people and you need three eggs. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna combine the flour. Oh, you need a cup of that. How do you, how do you feel about this recipe right now? I, I would be throwing that recipe in the trash. I'm like, mom, I'm gonna get another one. And I'm gonna find a recipe that lists my ingredients for me because that's how I'm used to seeing it. And that's how I can understand it. Legal writing is like a recipe to lawyers. If you don't put things in the way that they're expecting to see it, it's confusing and they will put it down. And that's the last thing you want is to have your paper in front of a judge and they put your paper down and instead go for your opposing counsel's paper. We don't want that, right? So we have to write in a very structured manner and put everything in the right place. And that's what's new and that's what's different. And you're expected to know nothing. That's the beauty of all this. We're expecting that you know nothing and that you'll open your mind and just be ready to change and to put this new structure together and learn how to build a legal recipe. That's really what we're doing. We're building a legal recipe. Yeah, Israel. Oh, I can't hear. Hold on. Is it me? I don't think it's me. How we extrapolate this to our personal statement in terms of income. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Have a recipe as well. Can you repeat that one more time with your volume up? Can you hear me now? Barely. Scream for me. Can you hear me now? I sure can. Awesome. Thanks again for your presentation, if you didn't hear that. I wanted to know if this recipe formula was something that we could extrapolate in terms of preparing our personal statement to enter law school. I would say that the legal structure is completely separate from personal statements. So I'm going to encourage you to go with what you know about writing when you write those personal statements. Don't try to put it any kind of legal structure or legal form. The beauty of the personal statement is you get to be creative. You get to express yourself. And it's maybe one of your last times to do that. <laughs> because once you actually get into school, now it's like, no, no, no. We don't want to hear that creativity anymore. We need it in this order. So I'm going to tell you, let's not apply what I'm saying here to any personal statements. You'll see how we'll apply it to the law and the facts, and then you'll get to do that over and over again in law school. Okay, great question. Okay, good. Okay, so let's try it. So we don't know the structure yet. We're going to learn a little bit about the structure. You're a lawyer. I told you you get to have a real case today. So you guys are lawyers, and your client uh, has come in to see you. Your client is a student at UCLA, 19 years old, sophomore in college, 
and your client's on the way to a football game. And the client told you that they stopped at a friend's house on the way to the football game. And at the time they were at that friend's house, the police came over to execute a search warrant. When the police executed their search warrant at their friend's home, they searched your client's backpack and found something in it. Doesn't matter what it is, but there was some, some proof of a crime in that backpack. And your client is now being charged and potentially serving a great amount of time in jail. And your client's like, help me, please help me. Are they allowed to search my backpack when I'm over at my friend's house? Is that permissible? As any good lawyer would do, I need more info, right? I'm, I was hoping right now you're like, ah, that's a not enough. I, I need more. Okay, why were you there? What were you doing? How long were you there? What was happening? And they're like, well, I just stopped by to take a shower really quick. You know, I, my house is the other direction. So I didn't want to go all the way back that way and then go to the game. My friend's house is right near UCLA. So I just popped in, took a quick shower, you know, got dressed in my t-shirt and my shorts and put my wet hair up in a towel and stretched out on the couch. Um, so we have the shower. They took a shower. They stretched out on the couch, got a beer. College student, right? We're on the way to a game. Why not have a beer on our way out? Seems like a rational, normal thing to do. Um, and then the police come as this person is laying out on the couch, bare feet, hair in a towel, drinking a beer, police come over. And the police search the backpack among all of the things that they're searching, according to this warrant, um, and find this evidence. What are we thinking right now? You're not expected to know anything about the law. What do you think? It's based on your common sense, what you feel, what you know from movies. Is this okay? Armin. I'm wondering when a search warrant is executed, is it, are the police allowed to search everything in the house or only the property that belongs to the homeowner? That is a very good question, Armin. What do you think is the answer? You're, I, you don't have to know the answer. What do you think? What's your gut telling you? Can they search it or no? Does it feel wrong? Does it feel okay? I would think that anything in the house that at the time when they when they're executing the warrant is subject to search. Okay, good. Yeah, so that's definitely a possibility, right? You have a warrant to search a premises. You should be able to search everything on that premises. And sorry, client, unlucky that you were there at the time, but that's life, right? So maybe they could search the backpack. Valerie, what do you think? Hello. Well, I'm gonna go after, um, off of what Armand said, how the police, would they know it's your backpack? You could say, oh, this is my backpack. I don't live here. But in reality, they're gonna be like, well, it's in, in this location, such as says, search the premises. So I'm gonna guess they're gonna use that kind of argument to like search everywhere. So Armand and Valerie on, are on the side. We can search this backpack. Marissa, do you feel the same? Or are you on the other side? I think that it would be permissible to search it, but I'm also wondering if the client was in the shower, um, is the item that was found in the backpack the client's or could it have been the property of the person who was home? Oh, it's the client's. It is the client's property in that backpack. Okay, so do we have anybody, anybody who thinks, no, you shouldn't be able to search that backpack? Any people on our own, our client side? Uh, yes, professor. I believe that I'm, I believe that I'm on the client side. Um, unless the backpack was open and show incriminating evidence, then sure, the police could take that as evidence, but it was closed. I believe the warrant only states that the police can only search anything that's in plain view. They cannot open up cabinets. They cannot shuffle through drawers. Um, I believe whatever's in plain view. So like, I, so, so like I said, if the backpack is open and you could see incriminating evidence in plain view, then yes, it's legal. But if it was closed, then I don't think it's legal for the police to like go through the uh, the backpacks uh, to the okay. person. I love it, Julio. Okay, so maybe you can only look at things that are in, that are open in view. You can't open cabinets or drawers. Maybe that's so this is just us, right? Before law school, before knowing any law, and honestly, the law changes, right? It depends on what jurisdiction you're in. Are we in California? Are we in Texas? It depends on whether you are in state court or federal court. So there's actually not going to be a right answer, but I'm going to show you, and I'm going to call on. I'm going to let. Um, Kristen and Jerrica come in on the next question because I want to make sure I get through this. They only gave me a limited amount of time with y'all. So we're going to move forward and get, take some more volunteers in a minute. But 
we'll see. I just have example law. So we're not going to take this as this is the law everywhere, just for the purpose of the class today. We're going to see one example test of what one jurisdiction does. OK, so let's look at that law. So the first case, uh, one, one thing I should mention to you is the way the law works is we look at previous cases. Have you guys heard of stare decisis, precedent? Is this familiar to you? So when our judge is going to make the decision on whether they could search this backpack, they're going to look at, well, what have courts said before? when visitors' belongings were searched? Were they allowed to be searched? Were they not allowed to be searched? What were the facts? What were the circumstances? And that is, we're gonna create rules from that and we're gonna apply that to our client's case. Okay, so that's why I'm looking at these cases. They're previous cases that have already been done before the court. So here's case number one. Officers searched the back jacket of a visitor while executing a search warrant for the premises. The visitor was at the home at 3.45 in the morning the visitor and other individuals were conducting a drug deal at the time of the search. So when the officers came to execute it, there's a bunch of people there and a drug deal is going down at that moment. And the court holds that the visitor's belongings, the jacket, was lawfully searched. The police were right. They could search this. But why? Because the visitor had a relationship with the premises. The court explained that although generally a visitor's belongings are not permitted to be searched, so no, generally we cannot search visitors' belongings just because they happen to be there. Here, the defendant was not a casual afternoon visitor, but was at the premises at an unusual hour during criminal activity. The circumstances suggested his presence was more than a mere passerby. Are we starting to see some rules here? Based on this case alone, case one, what's the rule? Can we search a visitor's belonging? What's our rule? Jerrica and Kristen, I know you didn't raise your hand for this, but I'm going to see if you got something for me. What do you think? Well, for me, I'm wondering like, well, first of all, whose name is on the search warrant and does that person even live there? Because um, for me, that's like a reply because if you're searching the home of somebody who doesn't even live there or they no longer live there or there's conflicting information on the search warrant, and then, you know, why are you searching the premises and the people on those premises, because if I'm not mistaken, doesn't there have to be like the exact name of the person who lives there or there's like- certain so that You're exactly right, Kristen. So this is for situations when you're not named on the warrant. When can we search a visitor, somebody who's not the owner, not named on the warrant and just happens to be there at that moment? When do the police get to search their bag according to case number one? Jerrica, I see you nodding. Do you have an answer? No, I actually completely agree with Kristen. The very first thing that came to mind was, okay, there is a warrant, but why is there a warrant? What are the reasons listed on the warrant? Why is this home being searched in the first place? Um, and this case, case number one just said, the court held the visitor's belongings were lawfully searched because the visitor had a relationship with the premises. So I'd Perfect. be interested in just analyzing and assessing what the reason was for that warrant that was held to whomever um, was living there or not living there. We don't know much information regarding that. So. Okay. So I love this, Jerrica. So you have nailed the exact part that we need to focus on. We are looking at whether the visitor has a relationship with the premises. We don't care, according to the court, what the warrant was for. Nothing in here says, well, if the warrant was searching for drugs, then you can search. But if the warrant was searching for a flash drive that demonstrated hacking, then you cannot search. What the warrant is for, no relevance, according to case number one. That could be our mind, and that's okay. But so now we've moved on from what we think to what the case is actually saying. And we, our opinion is now out the door, unfortunately. When we get to the law, our opinions don't matter anymore. We have to follow the law. What the law says is exactly what Jerrica just said which is we look if there's a relationship to the premises. How do we know if there's a relationship? Oh, well, look here. They were there at an unusual hour during criminal activity. Can we start to get a feel now for when maybe you can search a visitor's belongings, when there's a relationship? Are you guys seeing something there? Let's try it on a new case, okay? So let's go with case number two, and here's the facts. The defendant spent the night at a friend's house while his friend was out of town. Officers searched the apartment while the defendant was there and the defendant opened the door. They knocked for the search warrant, opened the door, dressed in a bathrobe. What do you think the court's gonna say based on case one, not based on your own opinions, 
based on precedent, right? Based on stare decisis, we've already had one case. We've seen what the court says. What do you think the court's going to do here? Is this defendant belongings? Is this visitor? It's a visitor, not on the warrant. Is this visitor's belongings allowed to be searched? Donald? I would say yes, because you don't spend the night at a friend's house while they're out of town. So that means that you did have some form of a relationship with the premises. So then the, the, the court would rule that you are able to search the visitor's belongings. Absolutely brilliant, Donald. So, so eloquently stated, beautiful, concise, exactly what the court said. You should be the judge, Donald. Okay, the court held the defendant's belongings were lawfully searched because he had a relationship with the premises. The court explained the visitor was an overnight guest, as Donald said, alone at the premises and answered the door only in a bathrobe and slacks. His presence was more than temporary and suggested he had a comfort level similar to that of an owner. Okay, so let's us create a rule because that's what we do in legal writing. We look at cases and then from the cases, we create a rule based on those cases, not based on our own opinions. We have to be able to point to something in the law that says it. So we're going to create a rule and I'm going to start us off. Generally, we know a search warrant for a premises does not allow an officer to search a visitor's belongings. Let's just start with the basis, right? We cannot search a visitor's belongings. However, there's an exception, right? However, an officer can search a visitor's belongings if, what's going in there? You guys are going to write this rule for me. An officer can search a visitor's belongings if what? Yeah, Tatiana. I would say that an officer can search a visitor's belongings if there's a relationship to the premise and if there's there at an unusual time. Okay, so I'm going to stop in the first half because we're going to get to your time. But I mean, beautiful. You're the professor today. Yes, that's exactly right. The visitor has a relationship with the process. This is what we do in legal writing. You guys are already killing it. Um, the visitor has a relationship with the premises. Perfect. Now let's take it one step forward as I like how Tatiana was doing. A visitor does not. I wanted to find what, what a relationship is, right? We know you have to have a relationship, but if you hear, hey, yeah, you can get searched if you have a relationship, I hope you're wondering, well, what the heck makes a relationship, right? If you're trying to inform someone of what the law is, they don't know what that means. So we have to define it. So we're gonna start by defining what is not a relationship. So Chinurai, if they are a mere passerby. Y'all are, my, y'all are, this is the first hypo I do in laws. Y'all are killing it. This is awesome. I mean, almost, it's too perfect for me. You guys are doing amazing. Yes. The visitor does not have a relationship if they're a casual visitor who is a mere passerby. I was not expecting this level of talent as just not even starting law school, but you guys are doing great. Okay. So let's do one more. When do you have a relationship with the premises? Yeah, James. Um, if if they were there at an unusual hour, they display familiar a uh, level of comfort familiarity with the premise, and they were there during criminal activity. Okay, I, part of what you have, I have a little bit later. So, and part of what you have, I have right now. You have the comfort idea, right? So that's what I have first. So you do have a relationship if it's your presence is more than temporary, and you have a comfort with the premises similar to an owner. Right. That's what the court said. We're just synthesizing these rules and making one rule statement that kind of combines all the ideas from the cases. And then I'm going to add in James's ideas. There's also things we can get into detail in. It would come later in your paper. But, you know, the time the visitor was there, the activity the visitor was engaged in, the presence of others in the home. These are all things that the court cares about as well. So now we have our client like, am I going to get convicted? Help me. Should I settle and just take the plea deal that the prosecutor is offering me because I'm going to lose? Or do I have a strong case? I shouldn't take that plea deal. I should go to trial and fight this because all the evidence they have is in that backpack. So if I'm going to win, I I don't want to take a plea deal. I want to go home, right? I I want to go back to my house and not have to take any time in jail. So we have to give some good advice here, right? And we know that this is what the court will look at. They're not going to care about my opinion. Even though I'm a professor, it doesn't matter. Nobody cares what Professor Knowlton thinks. They only care about what the law says, about what the cases say. We've summarized the law. This is it. So I'm going to ask you for a second to put your thinking hats on. And I'm going to get some arguments from the prosecution. 
And I want to hear some arguments from our client side. Okay, let's do prosecution first. Will your client win? No. Our client does, does have a relationship, right? If our client has a relationship, our client loses, right? The police were allowed to search her backpack. Anybody have an argument here? James, is that hand, a hand up again? I'll take it. Um, I can argue that the client does have a relationship with the premise because in your um, hypo, the client does display a level of comfort with the premises. Um, the client went in, took a shower, uh, relaxed on the couch with you know her hair down or their hair down, so on and so forth. And I even like, you know, took a beer from the, the premise. So. And what does the beer have to do with it? It just, um, it shows that they are familiar enough with the premise to know that they're able to do that. Um, maybe. <laughs> I love it, James. I love it. You've nailed all three of my things. I do have the beer. I want Miriam to tell me if, or anything you'd like Miriam, but if you have it, I'll take any more on the beer other than just comfort. It does show comfort. I completely agree with James. Is there anything else there other than just the comfort, Miriam? Um, well, I was going to fight or like be on the other side that, it, that she doesn't have a relationship. Okay. Then let but me hold up like, on Miriam. So sorry? I'm going to call on, I'm going to call on you for that, but I don't <laughs> want to get us confused. So let's stay just <laughs> on this one. And then I'm going to come to that. So do you want to answer good. this one <laughs> first or no? Um, Professor Dalton, I'm going to act like your TA and jump in here. So somebody put in the chat oh, that thank you the student um, was also 19 drinking the beer. Perfect, okay, good. Um, how do I get my chat? Thank you, Dean Garkanian, let me see. I don't, I can't, act, I don't know where my, oh, here it is, chat. Okay, sorry, I wasn't paying attention, I appreciate that. Okay, yeah, so the bitter, the right to, I'm gonna just go with uh, what Dean Garkanian said, <laughs> that somebody had said the student was 19. Very good attention to detail, right? Really paying attention to the detailed facts that matter. Is that person brave enough to speak and say why that matters that they were 19? What case does that link us to? Why does it matter that they were underage drinking? What does that have to do with the law? Which case would be helpful there? Just speak out if you were that chatter. Maybe not. Okay, anybody then. Go for All it. Right. That was me who put that in the chat. Um, oh, great, Jerrica. I guess... Um, well, number one, he, the student was obviously already underage. And again, it goes back, it sort of goes back, at least for me to case number one, where it shows that, wow, like this kid, um, well at 19, I still consider myself a kid. Um, but this kid is comfortable in this home and the kid is, or the teenager is able to maneuver through the house, knows where things are. So, um, if I were a cop, I would question that. Um, what so, is it like, Jerrica? What from case one does it remind you of? What were they doing there that this well, is kind of like? If we were going to try to put the facts up next to each other. He was, I mean, the student was lounging around. So there's definitely comfort within the premises and laying on the couch with a beer. Um, that is sort of, at least to me, would be reasonable if I were a cop to say, hey, what are you doing in the middle of the day at 345 drinking a beer on a couch? You don't live okay. here and you're underage. Okay, so we have this. This is perfect. It is comfort. Everything you're saying, I'm looking for one particular word to add on. You've nailed it, Jerrica, that is underage drinking. I'm going to go with Nicole because I haven't heard from her yet. What is it, Nicole? What am I looking for here? It shows that uh, the defendant is engaging in criminal illegal activity. Right. So we have both arguments. Thank you. Perfect. So remember from case one, there was a drug deal. And part of what they said was that it was in the middle of the night and you were engaged in criminal activity. And when you're engaged in criminal activity, that certainly makes you feel a little bit more comfortable with the premises. If it's criminal activity you're doing on the property, underage drinking is illegal, even at home. So can't do that. Criminal activity. So all of these things go ahead and equal. There is a relationship with the premises. This is called legal analysis, and you guys are excellent lawyers. Now let's do the other side. I'm going back to Miriam. Your client does not have a relationship with the premises. The police were not allowed to search that backpack. We should win. Miriam, what's your argument here? Um, like, okay. So 
I'm like in between. I think that police, like given the situation when the police like barges in the house, they're going to probably search up the backpack because all they see is like a girl or a boy in a towel drinking a beer in like a friend's apartment. And I think in normal life, like if I go over to a friend's house and take a shower and like just sit in my towel and my hair and everything, just chilling. Yes, then the client would lose. But I think given the situation that they were going to a football game and like on a college campus, basically, or like a dorm or a friend's apartment, like during college life, I think it always happens. Like a friend of a friend's goes to another apartment and they just take a shower or, or anything happens like that. Like, I can't tell you how many times I go to an apartment because my friend's boyfriend is like the guy's friend. And I'm just sitting there and I feel so comfortable, but like, no, I don't necessarily good. even. Yeah. That's a great <laughs> example. I mean, that actually goes along a little bit with the storytelling that Dean Dickerson was talking about. You just related me very, very well, Miriam. Um, you can visualize Miriam. You're there with a friend. And you happen mm-hmm. to come over right before a yes. game. Maybe that's not a relationship with the premises. Mm-hmm. Now, and so I like what I got from what you said matches up to what I was thinking is, you know, it was just a casual afternoon visit. Yes. Excellent. It's not an unusual hour, right? It's an afternoon on the way to a game. It was not unusual activity. Mm-hmm. Just as normal stuff that college students do. No big deal, right? People take showers, um, all the time at a friend's house. This is an unusual activity. I love that. Kristen, what do you have to add? I want to go back to like, whose name was on the search warrant? Cause I, uh, and cause then like, when it says like, your client does not have a relationship with the premises, if the person doesn't even live there, whose name was on the warrant, then you could argue that that person does not have a relation to that person on the search warrants. Like there's no relationship with that person. So therefore they don't have a relationship or relationship to that person's premises or, you know, their home. So you could argue that. So, I mean, okay. my question. So, so we're going talking. back to the general principle. We're going, I think we're going, I think this is correct, Kristen, that we're going to the general principle that generally you cannot search visitors belongings. So that is correct. You cannot search visitors belongings. We could even put this as like a general thing up at the top here before my bullet point that, Hey, we can't search a visitor's belongings, first of yeah. all. And then second of all, it doesn't meet the exception. It doesn't meet the exception because they were just a casual after visitor. They didn't have a relationship. So I like that, Kristen. That's excellent. What about Donald? Let's go back to Donald. One question I had thinking about this was, is, was the person that was the visitor identified? How do we know that they were underage drinking? We never had actually asked for their identification. We never actually identified who they were. We just went through their stuff and assumed that they were illegally drinking. We didn't know that they actually were underage at the point at the time that the police officer searched. So I'm join my laws class, please. That is brilliant. That is brilliant. I have, I have a different response to the illegal activity, but I love yours. When an officer walks in, that's what they're seeing, right? The test is what an officer would know at that time. How is an officer to know that this person is engaging in criminal activity? So that is not a reason. That one, and I'm going to hit that in a second. I just don't want to go out of order, Donald, but that is coming on my list. Um, That is not a reason to establish a relationship if you don't even know their age, right? I had a different argument. I actually like yours better, Donald. Um, My argument was that this is not like a drug bust. It was more in line with what I think Miriam was saying with respect to, hey, a drug bust, that's a big deal, right? That's unusual activity, right? That is a real serious crime versus, hey, you know, college kids drink beer all the time. This is not comparable, right? This isn't the type of thing that shows you have such a level of comfort with the premises just because you have a beer at someone's house. As Miriam said, she could be there with her boyfriend, grab a beer, never been there before. That doesn't establish a comfort. It's a different kind of crime, right? But I actually like Donald's better Love that, Donald. Brilliant. Um, so what I had was that it was just a quick stop on a football game. I think we passed there. They're a passerby. Although they showered, it's not like spending the night alone. It all goes to the same thing, right? We want to address the prosecution's argument. She took a shower. Oh, wow. You know, that's not the same as being there alone at night, answering the door in a bathrobe. It's not the same as taking a shower. Um, so then I have my criminal one. Beer on Crouch is not the same as a drug deal, but I'm going to actually add into that um, our further comment about the fact that a police wouldn't even know that she was underage. So under all those arguments, there is no relationship with the premises. Okay. 
So we have our arguments. We have our rule. We know everything we need. I have just somehow, I'm proud of myself, in 30 minutes taught you legal writing, a whole year of legal writing. This is what you need for legal writing. And you will do it in much more depth, much harder cases, much harder facts. But this is what we're going to do all year long. And it is fun. We're going to hear your arguments. We're going to debate it. We're going to negotiate it. We're going to have a lot of fun. A lot of legal writing is actually the analysis part, understanding the facts, understanding what is the law, having debates about what is the law. Could the law be this or could the law be that? And then debating the arguments. And of course, at the end, we got to write it down. We got to put all of that wonderful knowledge on paper. Um, but a lot of legal writing is actually what we just did today. And you didn't pick up a pencil. Um, I would say that was more than 50% of it is that. Um, and then what we do have to do, though, is write it down. <laughs> so we have a structure that I told you about. And this is the structure. It's called CREAC. You start with the C. You state your conclusion. I am so convinced that our client did not, we did not have a relationship. Our client should not have had the backpack searched. So I am going with Donald and I am going with the police were not permitted to search that backpack. Then we put our rule. It would be the whole paragraph that we wrote, but an officer can search if they have a relationship. That's the next part. Then we actually have something called the explanation. That's where we put our case summaries. We got to show that we're right. We didn't make up this rule, right? We started by making up rules. We were kind of on track, a little off. We got to show, hey, I'm not making this up. This actually comes from actual cases. And so we're going to summarize those cases for our reader, for the judge, or for our partner in the law firm. Then we're going to apply the rule. We're going to put arguments for the prosecution first, or we're going to put arguments for the defendant. We'll put both sides' arguments in the paper so your reader can see both. And then we're going to conclude again. Therefore, the officer were not permitted to search. Y'all just wrote your first legal memorandum verbally. We didn't write it on paper. But I think you could take those words and get them down onto the paper pretty easily. That's laws. That's what we do. It is heck of fun. Uh, and I cannot tell you that this is will be your favorite class because it's not anything in terms of what you're thinking. Um, I actually brought my TAs here today and I saw five minutes left. I have one more slide. But before I get to my slide, I brought I have two teaching assistants, Isamar and Alexis. They are amazing, amazing students, and they represent Southwestern and what Southwestern is about. If you want to know the type of students you will be going to school with, this is them, and they're awesome. So I brought them to share just a minute or just a quick, like, what did you like about legal writing? What do you like about Southwestern? I just wanted you to get a chance to hear from students with respect to this class. So go for it, Isamar. Hi, everyone. So I'm Ismar. I'm a 2L in the traditional day program. And yeah, laws was my favorite class. It's where me and Alexis met and we're best friends. Um, so, you know, you could meet your law school best friends in your laws class. And it really is a safe space. It's one of your more intimate classes. Usually it'll be around 20 to 30 students versus the bigger classes, which could be like 60 or 70. Um, and so that was uh, really great. I love laws. I um, graduated with a bachelor's in finance. And so I hadn't written anything um, until my personal statement in law school. So I definitely fell into the category of nervous about legal writing. But exactly what Professor Knowlton said, it's a very much fill in the blank. Um, she gives you um, all of the resources you need to do well in the class. You just have to apply them. And it's really fun. And I did, you know, I did well and I was proud, but I definitely put in the work and I love the law. It's fun. And especially the negotiation part. I'm also on the negotiation honors program. And so, you know, I'll leave my email in the chat. But, you know, if you have any questions about Southwestern, I will tell you one thing. Um, when determining which school I wanted to go to after, you know, experiencing all those, Southwestern has the nicest people that you will ever meet. So if that's a community that you want to be a part of, then then Southwestern is your best choice. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Isamar. Alexis. Okay, that was really hard to follow up. Um, thank you for stealing my speech. But my name is Alexis. I'm a traditional 2L day program student. Um, yeah, laws is definitely my favorite class, not only because of Professor Knowlton, but the resources that the school gives you. We have a writing center that can actually help you if you're really struggling with any grammar issues or any structural issues. They can really, really help you. So 
not only does laws prepare you for real practice, but the legal writing, everything that the school offers can really, really help you in real life practice. I know over the summer, I used the library's resources a ton. So that was a plus for me. Um, what else? Eastmore just stole all my thunder, guys. She's my bestie, but she stole all my thunder. Um, yeah, we're all in the negotiation honors program. It's super fun. I'm going to leave my email in the chat too. And you guys can email us with any questions you have. Thanks, Alexis. Um, so I so I forgot to put this last little thing up. My formula for you will learn this formula pretty. It might vary a little based on what professor you have for legal writing, but we all follow some format of this. Some people will collapse the R and the E into one thing and just call it R and a BC rack. You know, different people must. I might call it the I instead of a C. The E react. Uh, I react. Sorry, but no matter what, you will be following this formula. So I created my own formula for y'all on the formula for choosing the right law school, right? That's what you're here to do, right? You're trying to find out about what law school is right for you. So I'm gonna help you, okay? I've got you a formula. I want you to follow this formula, practice. Practice following this formula, just like you're gonna do in legal writing, okay? The first thing is a C, of course. You gotta consider all of your options. I know that you have a lot of choices. There's a lot of schools out there um, and I want you to consider all of them. But as you consider them, I want you to remember my R, I want you to remember how supportive Southwestern's faculty is. You heard Dean Dickerson talk about that at the beginning in her speech today. It is not just a statement, it is real. I can tell you, I literally could never come up with the number of times students have come in to my office and said, I cannot believe how lucky I am. I got the best section ever. Section one is the best. We have Carpenter, Heilman, and Hart. I don't understand how they give all the best professors to one section. And then literally the next day, somebody else comes in and they're like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe they give all the best professors to section B or section two. I've got Brown, I've got Wiseman, I've got Popovich, they're all the best. And I sit there and I hear this over and over. And I'm just feel really blessed to be with colleagues who are absolutely amazing teachers. You know, think back right now to your favorite class you've ever had. It's because of the professor. That is why that is your favorite class. It's not the subject matter. It's because the professor made it relatable, made it fun, engaged with you. There's something that professor did. Imagine every single one of your classes being your favorite professor. That's what you're going to get at Southwestern. It's amazing. It's, I'm being genuine from my heart. I really believe this. Um, so I want you to remember that as you are considering your options, remember the professors, they're supportive. They're here to help you. They're not trying to fail you out. They're trying to make you succeed. And it's unique. I've taught at three schools and there's nothing like the professors at Southwestern. Okay. My E, are you ready for my E? I want you to eliminate all law schools that don't emphasize practical training. All law schools are going to teach you how to think like a lawyer. Southwestern will teach you how to think like a lawyer. Harvard and Yale are going to teach you how to think like a lawyer. Southwestern does something else, though. Southwestern doesn't only teach you how to think like a lawyer. Southwestern teaches how to practice like a lawyer. I heard for the first time from Dean Dickerson, her bridge to practice program is a perfect example. We don't let law students out the door unless they're ready to practice. My brother, who went to UCLA Law School, showed up on his first day of work at the public defender's office. Hi, I'm David. I'm here to work. They handed him a file and said, oh, you have a case right now in court in 10 minutes. He had no idea what to do. He panicked. He was frozen. He didn't have a clue how he's supposed to handle this case. That would never happen to a Southwestern lawyer. When you're at Southwestern, we have the best externship program in the entire country. You, you are going to do an externship. And so you're going to get practical training on the job. Our externship office is amazing. They will find not just an externship for you, but an externship that you enjoy, are passionate about, who has a very good leader that's going to help you learn. They won't even let you be placed somewhere where the leader isn't helping you learn, helping you get better. So by the time you get out to practice, you've done an externship, you've had this experience under guidance. So when you walk into the PD's office, you're like, give me the case. Where do you want me to go? What courtroom? Give me the number. I'm ready. I'm there. We have clinics. We have the advocacy programs that uh, Alexis and Isamar were talking about. Uh, you want to be a trial lawyer? We have a special program just for that. You want to be a pellet lawyer? We've got that. Mine's the negotiation honors program. Do you know in 2020, we are the number one negotiating team in the country. 
as every single law school in the entire country, Southwestern was the best. It's actually the girl, one of the girls, there's two girls who won it, but this is one of them, Vanessa right here. Tamar is not in this picture, her partner, but um, they're the best negotiators in the country. Southwestern is no joke. You want to close that deal? You want to be the entertainment lawyer, the business lawyer that everybody's like, wow, I want him or her to represent me, them to represent me. You're going to come to Southwestern and learn how to negotiate. Um, tons of programming, not like anything. The scale labs that Professor Gunning puts on, you don't learn just evidence. You learn evidence in a courtroom by doing it. So E, if they're not giving you this, they're out. That should not be a consideration for you. You need to be able to practice um, and be ready to go. So eliminate any schools that are not giving you this. And I can almost promise you that Southwestern will remain as one of the top on your list. And yeah, I know I heard Popovich say, I'm not trying to sell you. Oh, I'm trying to sell you, no lie about it. I think this is the best school. I've been here for 14 years. This is my 15th year here. I love it and I genuinely love it. So heck yeah, I'm trying to sell you because I think it is the best choice for you. So A, accept that Southwestern has the best student body um, out of all of the schools in the country. You will not find a more supportive, intelligent, look at, I mean, look at just, some of the stuff you're going to hear from Southwestern students while you're going through all these uh, admissions meetings, they're brilliant. And you want to be around brilliant people that make you think smarter. I was watching Isamar prepare for negotiation the other day. As her professor, I'm in awe. I could never have thought of that. I could never have said that. That inspires me. So you want to be around people like this and not people who are competitive. They're supportive. They want to help you. The students at Southwestern are the best. So finally, my C, my final in your formula. I'll just leave this how it is. That's my answer for you. Come to the end of the formula. You guys will choose Southwestern and I will see you in my laws class um, in the fall, hopefully. Or if you join SCALE, I'm, I'm new to SCALE. Um, love the program. I got to put a, a pitch in for SCALE. Two-year program, very practical learning. Everything is about practical learning. Run by Dean Rolnick, the best. You will have such a great relationship with her. It's a great program. So that's our two-year program. Just consider it. I had to, I had to put my pitch in there. Um, but thank you all. I will also put my email in the chat and I am happy to talk to you further about any questions you have about laws. I didn't have time for questions if I wanted to get through my class, but I am open and available for questions at any time. Okay, but I have to end. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Knowlton. That was as wonderful as I knew it would be. And there was so many wonderful comments in the chat. Hopefully you'll get a chance to um, scan through some of those. I think our students really enjoyed that. Um, so next, we're going to go ahead and uh, turn the program over to Vice Dean Garakanian, who is going to moderate our wonderful panel that's upcoming. Thank you. Great to be here and fantastic to sit through Professor Knowlton's presentation. Like her, I'm also a legal analysis writing and skills professor. Um, laws professor, and this is my 20th year at Southwestern, and I couldn't agree more with her formula that she shared on that last slide. I love this school. When I came to Southwestern to interview for a job, like the thought, the feeling that I had was like, wow, law school can be a happy place. Who knew? That wasn't my experience at my law school. It wasn't the experience I heard about from the colleagues that I worked with. Um, when I did big firm litigation work, some pro bono work. And so coming to Southwestern and seeing the joy was very, very refreshing to me. And I said, I'm going to retire from Southwestern. And 20 years in, I'm still thrilled with the school, with the leadership, the top down and the students or the bottom up. There's a lot of intelligence and brilliance, as Professor Knowlton said. But most importantly, there's a lot of heart. There's a lot of heart among our students, among our staff and faculty. So fantastic to be spending this Saturday morning with you. I have the pleasure of moderating a panel about what Professor Knowlton talked about, that practical experience, the value proposition of experiential learning. So here's the thing, you're gonna learn how to do that legal analysis. That's the foundation of everything you do in law school and everything you do in practice. You're gonna learn that in a simulation setting, right? With hypothetical cases, with made up cases in your laws class, in your other classes. But before you graduate, you have to put it into practice in the real world of the law with all of its chaos, right? 
you got to figure out what it feels like to walk into an office and be given an assignment where it really matters. This is a real client. It's a real case. You don't want to do that like Professor Knowlton's brother on your first day on the job. We want you to be ready in your second year, in your third year as a part-time student, in your fourth year before you graduate, so that when actually you start your job as a licensed attorney, you're ready to go. And that's the reputation that Southwestern has. And that comes with participation in courses that are called externships, same concept as internships in college, so school credit elective course. You're working with a judge, a supervising attorney, and it comes with clinics. Clinics are law firms, essentially, that law schools run. You're being supervised by a licensed attorney who's your professor, and you're working as a young attorney in that office and representing clients, working on actual cases. So to hear about all this, we have five fabulous panelists, three current students, two graduates, I'm gonna ask our five panelists to please raise your electronic hand. That'll move you up to the top of the Zoom window for everyone. And Laura Hartman, Chelsea Zaragoza, Laura Lasco. We have Kanani Datan and Michael Morris. Where are you? Um, Michael, I, I think you were applauding me. Could you raise your hand? <laughs> I think that was the applause icon. So I'm going to ask our five panelists to introduce themselves um, a minute in terms of their program, their year or year of graduation, um, what they did before coming into law school. You bring so much experience with you into law school, and you should take a minute and think about that. And so we're gonna hear from our panelists in terms of what they did personally, professionally, academically before coming to law school, and then highlights of what they've done in law school in terms of their experiential learning. So about a minute introduction by each one of them. I'm then gonna pose some questions to them and then we're gonna leave time at the end for your questions. So let's start with Chelsea. Hi everyone, good morning. It's so good to see you all here. My name is Chelsea and I am a 3L student in the traditional day program. So I will be graduating next May. Time has really flown by. I got my bachelor's in sociology with a concentration in criminology from Cal State Northridge in 2017. So I took about two years off between getting my bachelor's and starting law school. I was working for the city of Monterey Park and I was also volunteering at Bedsetic Legal Services. They had just recently opened their kinship care project. So I was working with, you know, guardianships and helping secure legal permanent residency for immigrant children. So I was doing that during my time, that in between time. And since I've been at Southwestern, I think I've been able to delve into everything that the school has to offer. My first externship out of my 1L year, so that summer, I externed for a federal district court judge here in Los Angeles. That following fall, I worked at the United States Attorney's Office in the criminal division. So if any of you are like me that had no idea what the U.S. Attorney's Office is, it's consider it or think about it as like the DA's office, but on the federal level, so prosecuting um, cases or individuals that have violated federal law. I did that my fall semester of 2L, and then the next semester, I decided, you know, I haven't really gotten that client interaction of being able to represent one individual person. So I decided to join Southwestern's Community Lawyering Clinic, where I was supervised, like Dean Garconian said, with one of our own professors, um, Julia Vasquez. And after that uh, clinic, I decided, you know, that I still need to work on oral advocacy and public speaking. And so from then on, I went to the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. I'm still there. So I've been there since June and I've been at their Compton branch doing preliminary hearings, arguing motions, writing motions, um, being able to kind of marry everything that I've learned uh, in one place. And so if any of you have any questions about I mean, 
really anything, judicial externships, criminal law externships, clinics. I'm more than happy to sit down and talk with any one of you. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, Laura Lasko, and then we'll go to Laura Hartman, our other student panelist. Hi, I'm Laura Lasko. I am a scale 2L student, so the two-year accelerated program. I'm in my final year and will graduate in May. Um, I did not come from any law background. I just entered law school because that was my newfound passion that I had in life. I, my bachelor's, I graduated with a music performance degree. Then I went to culinary school. I opened my own business, uh, PR marketing. So everything outside of the law. And then I was like, it's time to go to law school. Southwestern was the perfect fit for me. And I'm very happy with my decision. Uh, in this scale program, we get a great opportunity in certain classes to get this additional experiential learning, especially in our evidence class, we get these mini labs. So it's like a very mini mock trial. And I was like, this is fun. So then when the trial advocacy honors program had their tryouts, I was like, oh, it must be like a bigger version of this. It must be fun. So I tried out for it. Now I'm the competitions chair and a senior advocate on the trial advocacy honors program. I competed for the first time. And my lovely coach is here today, Michael Morse. And, you know, I just, the experience of that got me then interested in my externship this past summer. So I became a certified law clerk and got to speak on the record in the preliminary hearing unit. And just so you know, I, I understood none of this. I didn't know what preliminary hearing was. I didn't know what any of it was. And in the end, you know, I did 11 prelims in front of five different judges and they were all held to answer. And, you know, you just learn along the way. And I think that Southwestern has definitely helped with all the stepping stones to get to the point that I am today. Very excited to speak with you and answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Laura. Laura Hartman? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Laura Hartman. I am in the evening program. I'm in my fourth year, so I will also be graduating in May. Um, so similar to Laura, before um, coming to law school, I did not have a legal background. I was actually doing sales and marketing and actually some property management. Um, and for me, like, I really felt a calling to go to law school, just kind of based off of a lot of the um, stuff that was going on in our country, um, in particular, like, a lot of the immigration stuff, I was just finding myself, like, really upset about it all the time, coming home from work, and um, wishing that I could make a difference. So Southwestern, for me, was, like, the perfect fit, because at the time, for my first two years, I was still working a full-time job all day, every day, and then going to school at night and studying on the weekends. Um, and Southwestern really made it so um, possible for me to still keep up with my studies and actually excel in my studies while supporting myself with my full-time job. Um, then last year, I got the opportunity to participate in the immigration law clinic, which was just so meaningful to me because I was actually helping like real clients help them gain access to citizenship and um, you know, meeting with clients that had been through traumatic things. And it really felt like such a difference to me, like being able to put the things that I had learned in my first two years into effect by meeting with real clients. And I just felt like it was almost like a full circle moment for me. Like I remember just a few years ago being at home and feeling so helpless and like not knowing how I could help. Um, I've also done, well, actually from that, um, my clinic professor, Professor Ramos, who I love and was so supportive and so Encouraging. She actually helped me get a summer position with Public Counsel, which is a public interest law firm. And I was working for the Children's Rights Project, um, helping LA foster youth get adopted. So I did that all summer. That was also some really good hands-on experience with, you know, meeting with real clients and helping real families. Um, and this was just like really what I was picturing when I wanted to be a lawyer. So it, uh, my clinic experience and my internship experience has just been so meaningful to me. And I'll I'll finish up, but I'm currently externing with Project for the Innocent, um, doing post-conviction habeas work um, with clients that were wrongfully convicted. Um, and that opportunity, I just was able, um, when Southwestern announced that partnership at the end of the summer, I was so thrilled to be able to do that. And so now I'm currently investigating um, different cases. Um, I'm flying with um, the director of the program of Project for the Innocent in Los Angeles. Um, we're flying to North Carolina next week to interview a witness from a case like from, you know, a client that's been incarcerated for decades. So like, it's really, it really feels like I'm like, I'm reading with real clients and it really feels like I'm making an impact. And that's what I was looking for. 
And that's what Southwestern has been able to provide me. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So we have our two alums. Um, let's start with Michael Morris, and then we'll hear from Kanani Datan. Thanks, Professor Garkani, and really excited to be here. Excited for all of you who are on the precipice of like this transformation, transformational experience you're going to have in law school. So it's a real exciting time for all of you. Um, so um, I started law school out later in life. Um, I, I went to school, back to school later in life. I, uh, when I was 18, I went straight to work and I ended up working for a bank. Um, which was a uh, maybe a financially rewarding um, position, but not necessarily rewarding in other ways. Um, I found my way uh, back in school. I went to Cal State LA for a couple of years as a uh, English major. I then transferred to Southwestern and I started my first day of law school the day after my 30th birthday. Um, and um, I wanted to be a prosecutor um essentially when i went to law school when i started law school that's what's in my personal statement and so on when i got to law school i began taking criminal law classes and classes related to criminal law and i uh, rediscovered if you will my sharp defense leanings um having taken uh our wonderful criminal law professor's class uh, professor carpenter ended up being her teaching assistant and working with her on some of her scholarship that she was focusing on at the time, which was the uh, constitutionality or the unconstitutionality, um, as she argued, of the uh, sex offender registration uh, programs as they existed at that time. Worked with her pretty closely on that as a research assistant, um, was later a teaching assistant and a course called Evidence, which focuses on uh, trial practice, which is very also very uh, criminal law centric in a way and um, ended up trying out for a program, an honors program called the Trial Advocacy Honors Program, which Laura just mentioned, um, and uh, ended up meeting a guy named uh, Professor Joseph Esposito, who was still uh, one of the co-directors of the program at the time. He was very, very high up at the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. Um, at that time, which was at the end of my 1L uh, year, I had resolved and I was un steadfast and unmovable in that resolve that I was going to be a Los Angeles County public defender. Um, I applied for the public defender's office right out of my first year of law school, which is when I met uh, director of program, uh, trial advocacy honors programs, Professor Esposito. Uh, the public defender's office had not yet called me back and he insisted that I come clerk with him um, at the Los Angeles County DA's office. I did so because the offer was right there on the table. I clerked at the hardcore gang unit uh, my first year out of, uh, out of 1L, um, out, out, out of my first year of law school. Um, I found myself doing all kinds of cool stuff. I mean, I went on ride-alongs uh, with the LAPD and other law enforcement agencies. Here I am, you know, a first-year law student um, at 2 a.m. in the front seat of a police car going about 90 miles an hour through a red light responding to uh, you know a man with a gun call and I'm thinking wow this law school thing is a lot more fun than I expected um, ended up clerking at the DA's office a couple of times um, because of my um, involvement with the trial advocacy honors program which is a really cool program and a great opportunity for students because um, and, and this is true for for all of our honors programs you get a chance to meet, to work with and meet and get to know um, uh, professionals and who are actually practicing in the area of law that you're focused on and you build um, relationships with them and you're able to uh, take advantage of opportunities. So my second year out of law school or the, at the end of my second year of law school, I ended up clerking for the DA's office again and I was clerking at the, uh, the Compton branch. I think that's where Chelsea said she's clerking now and their victim impact program, which is a, um, a unit that focuses on sex abuse cases, um, domestic violence cases and elder abuse cases. And I was working very closely with the deputy DAs there, giving great a great amount of responsibility. Like Chelsea, I was able, or like Laura and Chelsea, I was able to get on the record, do preliminary hearings. And at the end of my uh, law school, um, at the end of that experience, at the end of that summer, uh, I was actually uh, chosen as the law clerk to do a jury trial, um, a real trial, um, sort of all by myself with a, a supervising deputy DA who was just kind of sitting there, just kind of giving me pointers. I went through jury selection, you know, I was standing up doing direct examinations, cross examinations, um, opening statement, closing arguments, cross examined a real criminal defense attorney, was working with the real victim, going to the crime scene, collecting evidence, and so on. 
And um, I was like, wow. So I came back to uh, campus my third year, uh, feeling like I was already a practicing attorney. Um, of course, I wasn't, uh, but I, 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 you know, was able to get experience that, uh, quite frankly, a lot of attorneys who've been practicing 10, 15, 20 years have never potentially done a jury trial. And I did that in my third year of law school. Um, and that was all because of the connection that I had made at Southwestern with, at that time, my mock trial coach, um, who was a deputy DA, who was in the Compton branch. So essentially she said, hey, come clerk with me in Compton. And when it came time for uh, the management at the Compton DA's office to decide which law clerk, which intern essentially, extern, would be given this uh, jury trial, uh, my mock trial coach said, hey, you need to give it to Michael. Um, I coached him a couple of times. He's a great advocate. And she, she really kind of went to bat for me. And that's how I ended up with that trial. Um, it was an amazing experience. I came back to the to the uh, to law school, ended up clerking for the uh, public defender's office um, as well. Ended up clerking for the uh, ACLU and what is called their jail project program, uh, where um, at the time and I think it's still the case that uh, law students were able to essentially go inside of the LA County jail system and interview people who were incarcerated and complaining of um, conditions that constituted cruel and unusual punishment. Collected their their information, uh, assisted them in, in writing up declarations that would be submitted uh, through the ACLU in a class action lawsuit that they were doing um, against then Sheriff Wibaka, who you may know is no longer the sheriff, was indicted by the, uh, uh, the, the Department of Justice. Uh, so it was a righteous uh, lawsuit, it turns out, but I ended up having being able to work on that um, as a law student, which was an incredible experience. Um, graduated law school and um, you know, I applied for the public defender's office, applied for the DA's office because I had, uh, you know, built relationships in both offices, ended up getting hired, hired by both, fortunately, chose the DA's office because that's what I really wanted to do at that time. Um, I practiced in the DA's office for about six years, um, doing everything from misdemeanor cases all the way up to murders, um, ended up in the victim impact program, which is where I clerked at the Compton uh, office as a 3L, and that's where I ended my career as a deputy district attorney um, about a year and change ago, I um, began uh, uh, with the United States Department of Justice as an assistant United States attorney, um, as, uh, as has already been mentioned, which prosecutes federal violations of criminal law, um, thinking, you know, think cartels, national security issues, uh, corruption by public officials and police officers and, and federal agents. So that's what I'm currently doing. Um, excited to talk to all of you and to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Michael. Kanani? Tough act to follow. Um, I'm Kanani, so I graduated in 2018. I was in the traditional program. Um, prior to coming to Southwestern, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, my major was in criminology, um, and I went straight to Southwestern. I didn't have a job or anything in between. I was a student athlete, so add that to the mix, and I kind of didn't really ever have that practical experience that many of you guys have had bringing into college or law school. Um, when I was at Penn, I got to take a couple legal studies courses over in the business school, which kind of solidified that I wanted to go to law school, um, which kind of made me go into the criminology major because it was the closest thing that I could get to taking all of those legal studies courses. Um, realized that there is this thing called entertainment law that I could practice because sports has been my whole life and I always wanted to kind of continue that path, um, came to that realization. And so a softball dad who I played with his daughter, he went to Southwestern. He put me in touch with, um, at the time she was Vice Dean Carpenter. Uh, they raved about this school. I came to visit. I got to go on the Warner Brothers lot and I did this pre, uh, program similar to this um, and I just fell in love. I saw all of the practical courses. I saw everything that I could possibly do here. Um, my decision, my mind was made up. Um, so I moved back to Los Angeles. I started going to school here. Um, and then I just started taking advantage of every class that I possibly could. So I did copyright my spring semester, which is really unique because Southwestern is the only school, at least to my knowledge, I believe still, that lets a 1L take um, copyright in their first year. Uh, I believe Loyola doesn't let you, the surrounding schools don't let you. And that was really, really important because my first um, externship after 1L was over, they were like, wow, you already have that copyright knowledge under your belt. That's huge. 
So that kind of already put me one step ahead. So my first externship was entertainment litigation. Um, I quickly realized I don't like litigating and that's completely fine. Um, so I was like, okay, I have to do this the whole summer. Like, what can I take from it? I know I, this isn't going to be the path for me, but what am I going to do about it? And so I wanted to be a transactional attorney. And so I learned what did this, what happened? What went wrong here, which brought this case to litigation and how can I draft around it and not ever be here, hopefully, and never have any of my contracts end up in this place. Um, so I really kind of took that and that became my mentality and just, you know, learning the ins and outs though of how the entertainment side of things does get litigated. Um, so then I knew because I didn't want to litigate, what do I do? I visited Mitzi in the externship office and I was like, I need a transactional job. I really, really, this is what I want to do. I'm pretty positive. She was fantastic. Um, she ended up helping me get my next enter externship, which was in the fall. Um, and that was at a small production, like an upstart production company called Platform One Media. Um, they were recently purchased by Boat Rocker. So they're now Boat Rocker Media, which is really, really great um, and good for them. But because it was a, such a it was such a small house. And so I got exposed to everything. Um, I got to see projects from A to B and how from start to finish, from taking purchasing the rights to a book how that's getting developed, engaging a writer to do a script and all of the agreements that come along with that and how we protect the IP, right? Um, and the reason I was prepared for that, again, goes back to the practical courses I was able to take. So throughout my time at Southwestern, um, I took copyright law, entertainment law, um, television production law. I did the entertainment clinic. I did that for two semesters actually. Um, you know, I just took so many courses and that really, because they were practical, I was able to go into these externships and I had an idea of what was going on. I knew what those contracts look like. Um, and those professors were integral in that. And that brings me to the clinic. Um, highly, highly recommend the clinic. You have a panel of professors that are still practicing. They're incredible. They know what they're doing. They're all experts in different, you know, niches of entertainment law. And you're helping real life clients, you know, these are clients who may not have the funds, that's why they're coming to the pro bono clinic, you're doing their agreements, you're having conversations with them, you are talking to them, and you know you are protecting their projects and it's so meaningful, but it's so exciting at the same time. And again, I got to go into different, you know, I was able to take that into the externships that I had and I knew what I was doing, I felt like I knew what I was doing and I didn't feel so completely lost. Um, the last externship I had at Southwestern, um, I have all the things in the world to Dean Garakani and because she helped me, you know, turn it into an externship. And so I ended up getting a job at the NFL. Um, and I walked onto that campus and I was like, I needed to work here. How can I make it happen? It wasn't already approved. Um, and so I worked very closely with Dean Garakani and she helped me make it happen. And I was able to get credit for it. Um, and it was an amazing experience because even though I was doing tech law there, Again, and I have practical skills that Southwestern taught me, you know, that I was able to take into that, even though the law was slightly different and I could still learn and figure it out. Um, after law school, I then got a job at Donaldson and Califf. Um, it's a law firm, an entertainment law firm. Um, and the reason I got that job was because of the entertainment law clinic. And that's due in part to one of the, two of the professors really um, gave me really good recommendations, but one of them wasn't on my recommendations list. And I did not know that one of those professors was best friends with the managing partner there. Um, she caught wind that I was interviewing and called her up immediately and said, you need to hire this person. That's a really, really big deal. And I'm so fortunate that happened, but it's because I had the practical learning. I had the classes, like I put in the work I was taught those skills, you know, and it paid off. Um, and I, I'm really, really, really grateful. Um, which then brings me to my current job. Uh, I now work for, I work in house now for Los Angeles Media Fund. I'm an entertainment attorney there. Um, and we also own a sports agency. And so I'm also a registered NFL licensed agent. So I do both, I work for both. Um, and so for LAMF, I, we finance, develop, produce projects. And so I help do all those contracts, negotiations. And then for the sports agency, um, I'm within the football vertical. And so helping get that off the ground, we do, I do all of those contracts to the extent I have to negotiate with a club on behalf of a player, do that, help them off the field, um, marketing agreements, branding, licensing. Um, yeah, 
and uh, happy to answer any questions. So phenomenal lineup. Thank you for all of you sharing about your background and uh, Kanani, Michael, having been out a few years. I mean, the positions that you have now, incredibly competitive positions to secure. Um, and your credit to Southwestern, thank you for sharing your stories and being here. Um, I have a question for our current students. So Laura, Chelsea, and Laura, you've all three worked in the criminal justice system. So whether the post-conviction side or on the prosecution side, and when we think about law and the responsibility toward the client or the legal system, there isn't anything more stark than the criminal justice system and the lives that you have in your hand, right? Um, whether it's in the post-conviction context or when you're on the prosecution side, you know, are, 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 are we taking the right approach? You know, the consequences that would result for the defendant, what's going to happen to the victim or their family, et cetera. So can you each talk a little bit about how you approach this position of immense responsibility, how you felt prepared to do the work and feel confident in your ability to learn what you had to learn and do the right thing as you were given different projects. Um, whoever wants to go first. I can jump in first. Um, so I think we've heard this theme throughout, you know, the, the last hour and a half that Southwestern is teaching you the law and they're teaching you how to think like a lawyer. But there is something to be said about that hands on experience, because it's not until you're in that position and you're given this case file and, you know, there's victims in this case. And then you're also confronted with the reality that you are, you know, playing a hand in someone's freedom being taken away, too. It is such an immense responsibility that you know, isn't taken lightly and shouldn't be taken lightly. And I think when you think about you're a law student and sometimes you don't feel, I don't know, like you don't have as much experience as these attorneys do in your field. But I think the places where I have been, um, even working at the, with the, at the district court, I'm sorry, the judge is often confronted with like sentencing issues and whether or not when COVID started, we actually had a case on compassionate release, which is allowing, you know, a prisoner to go home earlier because of, you know, some underlying health medical condition, which was exasperated by COVID-19, right? And so in that externship and at the DA's office, I've had supervisors who are just so incredibly candid with me about the difficulty that it is to be struggling these two responsibilities, but that have always stressed the importance of doing the right thing, um, especially I think at the DA's office where you have those responsibilities to turn evidence over anything that you find. It's something that was really ingrained into us when we first started or when I first started at the summer, I have like this sort of checklist when I'm prepping files of, you know, carefully looking to see if there is discoverable information that needs to be turned over and notifying my supervisor immediately. But I think you know, Dean Garakanian has done these externship panels your very first year. And from there has really stressed the importance of being responsible in your externships and just really, um, well, above all else, right, just being really responsible and diligent and prepared. And if you don't know, ask your supervisor, because you don't ever want to be in the position where you think, no, I shouldn't have brought this to my supervisor's attention. And then what do you know? later you find out that you should have. And so just having that mindset, having that mentality and bringing it into my externships, I think has really helped me navigate this kind of immense responsibility that you're given and you're given as a law student. That's kind of how I've approached it. Thank you, Chelsea. Laura, last go. Think, oh yes, thank you. Um, so for me, um, it was all just a very daunting world because I, we start, you start in class and you're going to like read a case, lots and lots of cases. And you're going to learn like, how do you stepwise talk about this case? And basically what professor Knowlton was talking about earlier with the whole IRAC and like that all actually translates to once you get like 
a real file you look at and a real person in a real situation, not from like 1850 and the fire next door tort issue, but an actual like person. And so for me, you just have to stick to those foundational elements and things that you learn in class and see, can you connect the same as you just did in class? Uh, for me, a really good stepping stone was that I was in a small claims clinic, so it, no legal advice, but we're able to actually see people and hear their issues and help them, you know, move forward with the process. And if they do have a claim, what they should do. Then once you get to like being in an externship and you're actually in court and speaking on the record, you know, it's true that these are real people, real situations, real life. You're like, you're changing a, a situation. Um, you're changing a person's life um, based on like what you are actually doing. So for me, I'm always very, since, you know, I'm so young, we're like baby lawyers, not even lawyers. I always believe in checking and double checking and talking to your supervisor. I am very into communication and understanding exactly what I'm doing so that I can feel confident in moving forward with the situation. Um, there was a situation that I was asked, uh, a, a writing that I was asked to do, and I did not feel that there should actually, I, I believe we should submit that it, you know, it should not move forward. This was a situation that the case law was not in the DA's favor. And I just sat there and argued with the DA for two hours because I believe that my position was correct, but it was because of those foundational elements that you will learn in class to then bring forward and be able to deliver to an actual lawyer or the judge who I probably wouldn't have argued in front of, but, um, yeah, I think communication and I think knowing that you have foundational tools from Southwestern are essential. And having that confidence, Laura, that's phenomenal to point something out to your supervisor in terms of your opinion, your position, whether the office should be moving forward with something. That's fantastic. Laura Hartman? Yeah, so um, I actually, when I started law school, I didn't have a specific interest in criminal law. Um, I was more interested in, well, my my favorite class um, was constitutional law. I loved it. Um, and so that kind of got me interested in like civil rights. Um, and so I was I did um, a public interest, um, two public interest externships. And so um, when the Innocence Project um, externship opportunity arose, I was kind of looking at it from like a civil rights perspective, which of course is a bit intersection with the criminal justice system. It's like the sharpest edge of the criminal justice system. Um, and so for me, like, and one of the mottos of that program is there are no disposable people. And so that's what really like drew me to that program. Um, and so I'm still kind of navigating the criminal justice system. And I'm not sure now, I've, I feel like every externship that I do, I like love it. And then it opens up more career opportunities for me. So I'm in a little bit of a different situation than maybe some of the other students. I still, I don't know exactly what I want to be doing post-grad, but everything that I try, it's like opening more doors for me. So I'm not sure exactly um, if the criminal justice, if I'll be, you know, be doing like criminal defense or something like that. But um, with the with the habeas petitions that we're working on right now, it's really just about like restoring dignity to people that maybe have, that have had it stripped away from them. And I mean, of course, if you know, the ones that are actually innocent, like, I mean, that's the most, like to lose your liberty like that and to be incarcerated is kind of like the worst thing. Like that's like kind of the worst result that of the legal system. So doing anything that we can to remedy that. But for me, like, I really just keep going back to like what maybe what brought me to law school and remembering there's no disposable people restoring dignity to everyone and so i'm personally just finding out um the best way where i can make the most use and like have um like work to my highest potential i guess so i'm still figuring that out thanks laura and what you pointed out um is really important about doing externships or clinics it's an opportunity to to try on a practice area or a practice setting. And even if you decide that's not what you're gonna pursue, you would have learned so much that are gonna, that's gonna be transferable to the next position or next area 
that you get into. So I have a question for Kanani, a question for Michael, and then we'll open it up um, to any of you who have questions. Kanani, you talked about the Entertainment Law Clinic, which is like a law firm that Southwestern runs um, in the area of entertainment and the arts. So can you talk about like one example of a case or a client that you worked with that was like really memorable? You feel like you learned something really significant from that experience? Sure, yeah. Um, the one that immediately comes to mind, her project was one where I started it out in my first um, semester at the clinic and was with a team. So the way it works is that you've got five professors and when a project comes in or you're they're rolling over a project from the next semester, you will always have two returning students to kind of keep that continuity going with the professors. And so they're usually on every project amongst the two of them. I got put onto one project and I was enjoying it. We work as a team, we work together, and then we bring it to the professors for them to sign off on the agreements that we had put together. Um, and I was, I was really, really enjoying myself. And then Professor Gendron towards the end of the semester asked me to stay on for the next semester. Now, what's interesting about that is that my first semester was in the spring. So carrying into the fall, there is this summer portion where the clinic isn't running, but the returning students kind of still help keep that going to the extent something is time sensitive and really still requires our attention. And that was one of those projects where I was kind of just handling it myself in the summer with the professors. And that can be a little scary. Um, I didn't have, you know, my other classmates to still rely on and feel comfortable enough bouncing questions off. And I really appreciate what Laura Lasko said. And, you know, you always want to be, feel comfortable enough going to your supervisors, having that conversation, making sure that you know the assignment. And if you have any doubt about what you might be doing, better to ask them than to be wrong and communicate that to a client and you or you were in fact wrong. You don't ever want to give that bad advice. And plus, I'm not, I wasn't a licensed attorney at the time, so that's also running afoul. So, you know, doing that project alone and having to kind of be a little vulnerable doing that with the professors and saying, this is, this is what I think is right. And then hoping that that was the case, but circling that back to just the practical learning in the classes that I had taken, you know, I did feel a little bit more confident, um, but coming out of that summer semester and bringing that project into the fall and getting a new team. And, you know, it, I felt really, really proud of myself because I did it. I kind of conquered that uncomfortable feeling of, being uncomfortable, um, that's one thing law school taught me is get comfortable with being uncomfortable and don't be afraid to ask for questions. That's something that I, I, I mentioned before, I was a student athlete. And so I always thought like, you know, I, I did well in school and then I got to Penn and I was like, okay, I'm around a lot of smart people, a lot of people that are a lot smarter than I was. And so I had to learn, like I got a tutor immediately, like, and I brought that mentality into Southwestern. You have to bring that into your practical learning, whether that's a clinic, whether that's you know, an externship, no matter where you are. Um, and so being able to just conquer that, grow within myself, um, you know, and learn hands-on and get gritty with the, those agreements. Um, it really, really made me proud of myself. Thank you, Kanani. Michael, so in law school, you did a number of externships and then phenomenal that post-graduation, you had offers from the LA County Public Defender's Office, LA County District Attorney's Office. So in terms of the skills that you gained from your externships that made you so qualified for both of these positions, um, can you talk about that in terms of specific skills that you got through your externships? And it could also be, you know, maybe just character attributes that developed further in terms of your judgment or work ethic or whatever was really important, you think, um, in being able to secure these two very competitive positions? Sure. <clears throat> so I think even before I reached my externships, I think it started with the practical learning that I got from the trial advocacy honors program. Um, my externships were primarily based on um, areas of the law that, you know, were either 
at the point where I was involved with the case, there was a trial going on, or it was in the, on the litigation track towards a trial. And having um, worked so closely with very successful, talented, um, gracious um, mock trial coaches and alumni who sat with me for hours on hours late into the night, as Laura can attest to our competition process, and kind of explain to us what a case is and what it means, um, but also explain to us the importance of approaching um, a case or controversy um, in an ethical uh, way and, and it really emphasized to us that, you know, we would rather essentially lose doing the right thing um, than win, if you will, doing the wrong thing. And so with that sort of background and training that I got from that experience, I started my externships. And in my externships, I think I was able to um, approach the cases in that way um, to appreciate as our, as what has already been said um, the fact that, you know, to us as lawyers or law students, these are case files, um, these are opportunities to demonstrate our abilities and acumen and hard work, right? But for the reality is, um, these cases are people's lives, um, and we come to them and visit their lives at a time where um, there's a lot, there's at a, a time of turmoil many times in the area that I externed. And so I think that I, I was able to approach the externships in a thoughtful way, keeping those things in mind, uh, not only because it was an area of interest. Um, in other words, I externed in where I was very interested and passionate about. So I think number one, that put me in a position to do well. Um, and the, the training and the prepared, uh, the preparation that I received from the mock trial team and the coaches there, I think absolutely prepared me to approach the cases thoughtfully. Um, I think your supervisors, um, when you go into an externship setting, they can tell the students who are doing this who are resume uh, notation and the students who really believe this to be a meaningful experience and are taking it and approaching it seriously. Um, and I think that I was able to kind of demonstrate that because that's how I felt. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's as, as you said, uh, Professor uh, Garkanian, it's, uh, it is one of the most, this particular I, uh, area of the law is, is a, a very uh, important one. So it was, it was easy in a sense to be um, interested. Um, so I think I, I kind of was set up to do well in that sense, just in terms of the interest and the preparedness that I'd gotten from um, the mock trial team. Um, but second to that, I had also, and this kind of comes, this goes to every student coming into law school brings with them a body of experiences and assets that they can, they can sort of deploy uh, professionally, right? Some of us um, went straight sort of the traditional sort of track and you know, have excelled academically and come straight into law school with that body of work and experience and it sets us, it sets them up academically to, to excel um, and excel in many other ways. Some of us have some former careers or life experiences that we can sort of apply. I, I fell into the latter of that. And so I think I came into the workplace sort of understanding that, you know, it's not good enough or enough to be good at what you do. You also have to be a good employee. You have to be a good person. You have to be a good colleague. Um, you have to be reliable. You have to be honest. You have to be ethical. And you have to not only be those things, but demonstrate those things and communicate those things. And so I think having had a former sort of like, you know, career, um, I came into the offices that I came into understanding that that was a part of the, of the curriculum, if you will, um, and, and a part of how I was being um, assessed. And I think that, so the combination of the interest and preparedness that I got from Southwestern personally, and kind of approaching the workplace, like a workplace, um, I think that that helped me. I mean, because the reality is, I thought that um, the externship program and the practical experience of, of uh, law school was the most important part of the law school experience. I mean, when you pass the bar, uh, what the California bar says about you and probably any other bar in the state, uh, you are, quote, minimally competent to practice law. That's not exactly a glowing endorsement of your abilities. Um, having said that, the way that employers can judge how you actually are likely to perform as an attorney is they can look at how you've performed as an extern, um, what kind of employee you were, and so on. Um, and so to that end, employers uh, are interested in knowing who you are as a person, um, irrespective of your GPA or school, et cetera. And I think the externships, um, you know, gave me that opportunity 
to, to develop some kind of body of work and a track record, supervisors that could be contacted and, and to be, you know, to inquire as to whether I was the right person for this job or that. And so I think approaching it with all of those things in mind um, is what I think caused me to be successful, if you will. Also, you know, you get lucky and you, you make um, connections with people who help you. Um, and I think that that was a big part of my career as well. I had a lot of um, uh, mentors who took me under their wing. I try to do that as well. Southwestern tries to do that as a whole, I think, in terms of the alumni and the professors and faculty, which is what sets us apart, which was, has already been said. Um, but I think all, a combination of all of those factors kind of led me to, to, to perform as I did and a little bit of luck. And uh, yeah, that's how I got there. That's fantastic. Thank you, Michael. And certainly what Michael shared in terms of the character attributes and the importance of experience to securing a job, it's borne out by a national study. There's a study called Foundations for Practice with over 24,000 respondents from all 50 states, 70 plus different practice areas, where in terms of hiring criteria for first year attorneys, um, what matters most is experience and legal externships are right up there along with recommendations from practitioners and judges, not the professors. And what really matters, what this study shows is character. Your character really matters, that sense of responsibility, your commitment, your judgment. And so these are things that we all have to some extent, but it's definitely what the school, what Southwestern cultivates in our students. So thank you so much to our panelists. Great information, fantastic guidance. Um, we are going to open it up for questions for about 15 minutes. We are a little over time, but all of this has been so fascinating and we wanna give our guests a chance to ask questions. Um, we have the first question, it looks like, Tatiana. Hi, uh, my name is Tatiana Samui. I am currently majoring in biology and minoring in Armenian studies. My particular question is specifically for uh, Kainani. Um, I do have an interest in intellectual property law. While I'm not sure if that's the specialty I'll choose, um, I heard you mention that you did do some work with intellectual property. So I was just curious if it was more so on the side of copyright and trademark, or if there was also an integration of patents. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So um, I haven't had any interactions with patent law. Um, it's my understanding that you actually have to pass the patent bar to you know, to engage in that practice of law. Um, I also believe you have to have a bachelor's of science. Don't hold me to that, but um, it's just not something that I've ever touched. But yeah, I did. I have interacted a lot with copyright, the law firm I worked at, um, and even at the Southwestern, uh, the entertainment clinic, you know, we would look at projects and we would, what they call it, uh, doing clearance work. And so what that entails is looking at someone's project, reading the screenplay or watching the film um, and making sure no one's rights are being infringed. And that's really where copyright law kicks in. Um, it's also where trademark, trademark law kicks in. It's where your personal privacy rights kick in. Um, and so the foundations of understanding the law in practice and then combining that and marrying it with, you know, doing it practically it was really, really helpful because I was able to then talk the talk, so to speak, but then I could have actually demonstrated that I could walk the walk when I was in an interview for the law firm job post-grad. Um, so I did get that experience while in school, um, not just taking the classes, but practically being able to apply them um, and seeing how it worked out uh, with a real life client. Thank you, Marissa. Hi, thank you. So um, I've spoken with a couple of um, folks with, at Southwestern thus far, um, but I, I have a very particular um, niche area that I'm interested in law. And I'm wondering um, with very specific niche areas, how does the school work with um, finding or helping support um, externship placement? Great question, Marissa. So we are very flexible. Um, I've been the externship program director since 2005, and every year I'm approving new externship placements. So when a student comes to us and they're interested in a particular area, space law, for example, where there aren't 
too many opportunities. Um, or it could be something else. I work with a student to identify potential placements. We have a vast, vast network of alums, and we're able to do just the data search to see if any alums practice in that area and that geographic area that you might be interested in. So that's one way that we can start. Or you might come to me and say, you know, I already have a connection and here's the information. And so I follow up. I bet the placement to make sure it's going to provide you with a good educational experience. As you heard from our five panelists, that supervising attorney or judge becomes your primary teacher. So it's really important that they're not only a great judicial officer or an attorney, but they want to teach. So absolutely, we explore new opportunities. And Southwestern has the highest number of externship course enrollments among California schools, probably one of the higher ones in the country. Average, we do about 350 externships a year, um, and it hasn't slowed down during the pandemic. Um, we've switched to a lot of remote work, um, but otherwise, a lot of opportunities, including new ones. Thank you, Valerie. Hello, my name is Valerie Bello. Um, my question is for Lauren. Oh, sorry, Laura. Um, you did mention Child Right Project. I just want, um, I have a passion for children as well, and it's kind of like why I'm trying to main focus. So I want to know, get a little bit more information. Maybe we, I can email you or um, a little bit more information about what the Child Right Program um, project was. Yeah, sure. Um, so that was actually through Public Counsel, um, which is a pro bono law firm in Los Angeles, a really good law firm. Um, and so the Children's Rights Project, there's different like segments within the Children's Rights Project. There's um, educational. Um, so there's some that focus on educational like needs for schools. Um, and then th what the project that I was affiliated with was the Adoptions Project. Um, and so that was working with directly with um, LA foster youth um, and helping implement the adoption process to, to for children that were already um, in the in the foster system. Um, I'll definitely throw my email in the chat and you can feel free to email me. Um, also on campus, Southwestern has um, a children's rights clinic, which I think would be perfect because um, you'll get to experience all the different, um, you know, different areas of children's law. Um, and there's different externships that are involved in that as well. Um, yeah, I got mine through my professor through the Immigration Rights Project, and I I really loved it. And again, I'll I'll definitely throw my email in the chat. But if based on your interest, I think the Children's Rights Clinic on campus would be a great place to start. Yeah, so our Children's Rights uh, Clinic on campus, the law firm that we run, um, focuses on two areas of practice. One is individual learning plans um, for students. And then the other one is disciplinary cases. And the school, two of our students just had a tremendous win on behalf of a 12-year-old um, child student who had been suspended on like just unbelievably horrible um, circumstances and facts and just really bad treatment. Um, and our students were able to secure a victory for her. Uh, Armin? Thank you. Uh, my, my question doesn't go out to a specific person, but do any of you recommend any particular books to read before uh, prospective students start law school? While our panelists are thinking, um, one recommendation I have, whether it's the book or watch the TED Talk, is uh, Mindset, Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck. It's something that we really emphasize in our teaching and learning and practice ourselves, um, not to come to law school, which could be very challenging um, with a fixed mindset. You know, I'm just not good at this. I'm not just naturally inclined to be a good writer or a good, you know, oral communicator, but to have this mindset that, you know, maybe like I don't have the natural inclination to do X well, but what matters is that I am willing to learn. So I'm willing to be coached, I'm willing to be taught, I'm willing to put in the work, and I will grow. And actually, that will make me a happier, more satisfied person. So Carol Dweck, um, the mindset is what I would recommend. I don't know if our panelists have other recommendations. 
Um, I'll speak to that really quickly. I'll just say that for me, it had been a long time since I had been out of school, out of an um, academic environment. Um, so I, the summer before, I read books that I was just interested in, um, but I made it a conscious effort to like almost train myself to be like reading again, because I knew that obviously in law school, there's a ton of reading. Um, so I just wanted to like, kind of like reawaken that in myself. So, you know, I just um, read like di different history books that I was interested in, but um, I don't know, that was more like, I was kind of nervous about re-entering an academic environment. Um, and so I actually do really feel that that helped me. And then, yeah. Great advice. And uh, Nancy, our uh, admissions associate director has also included some recommendations um, in the chat. And what I also wanted to recommend is to train yourself to spend a little bit of time reading good writing while paying attention to that writing. Because as you learned from Professor Knowlton's class, so legal analysis, legal writing is the bread and butter of everything we do as attorneys. But also it's not just about the thoughts, like the brilliant thoughts, they need to also be communicated in a very clear way. So clear, concise, and precise. And how do we do that? So journalistic writing is very similar to legal writing in that respect. So if you're reading the LA Times, New York Times, sports section, arts, doesn't matter, but just paying attention to the sentence structure, paying attention to paragraph structure, how punctuation works, word choices, that's going to make you more conscious, more thoughtful in your own writing, and is going to make you a better writer. I would just add, um, I agree with everything that's been said, but whatever you... In Whatever you decide to read, I would recommend that you do it on a beach or by a pool on vacation. Um, and I say that only half jokingly because you know, you're about to enter what is going to be the most academically rewarding um, experience of your life, but also most academically rigorous. And so your you know, uh, idle time will be scarce. Um, so take that into account as well. You also may wanna say farewell to your family and friends, just kidding, kind of. Um, but, uh, you know, take into account the fact that, you know, you're going to be doing a lot of reading, uh, it's very rigorous. Um, so takes, get some me time. And as you also prepare and read those things that kind of put you at most at ease and prepare you and to enter into this journey. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your question. Jerrica. Um, thank you so much. So um, Dean Darkanian, you may be able to speak on this a little bit more. Um, I have a very specific take on attending law school, um, and my intention is to study business and corporate law, specifically to become um, a venture capital um, startup lawyer. Um, so really, my first question is, what is Southwestern's involvement in LA's VC ecosystem right now, um, if any? Um, and then- I'm sorry, one, LA's what? Um, LA's venture capital ecosystem, um, if any, um, you know, if you have information on that. Um, and I do have a second question as well that may be more apl applicable to um, some people here. Um, and I think that Southwestern's programs speak for itself when, you know, they talk about food pantries and the recognition of diversity, first generation, post-secondary students. Um, how would you, and this is, to panelists and staff members and students who are here. Um, but how would you describe the commitment to social justice um, in regards to the experiences, the actions of staff members and students within um, the campus itself? So I'll respond to the first part of your question and then leave it to our panelists who may wanna respond um, to your second part, and I'm happy to do that as well. So we do have six concentrations. Um, Dean Dickerson talked about, um, you know, the JD is a general degree, but you can choose to kind of specialize in one area, which you got to keep in mind, it's, it's only the foundational specialization, because there's just so much more to learn once you start practicing. But one of those concentrations is our entrepreneurship and technology law concentration. And we can put the link um, in the chat with respect to the description of the concentration and the courses that are involved. And so 
you may decide that that's what you want to pursue in addition to your required courses, taking a minimum 15 units um, in this list of courses. Um, and then as far as doing externships, working with companies or law firms that support um, tech startups, for, for example, that's something that we've done a little bit of, not extensively, but it is definitely something that we're always open to exploring. It's, it's always about the student's interests. So there's no shortage of connections or opportunities, but it's just a matter of what the student is interested in. And then in terms of the school's commitment to social justice, um, do any of our panelists want to speak to this? I can speak to this. Um, so in addition to all of my externships, I am also one of the co-presidents of the Latino Law Students Association. So this year I've had really the opportunity to work closely with administration to plan events and to really put on events for our students that they are interested in and really highlight issues that are really important to them. And so one thing that Southwestern's SBA, the Student Bar Association started last year was what we call the Safe Space Series. So every month we have a student organization who that highlights um, an issue that they want to make the greater community aware of to show them how to be an ally. And so one of the most recent one we had was one on bystander training, bystander intervention training, I'm sorry. We also did a safe series on mental health in communities of color. And so we have that just with student government, but we have so many active student organizations on campus that just really highlight so many different important issues. We have the Public Interest Law Committee. We have the Homeless, homeless Law Prevention uh, Group. We also have a group um, that works with mass incarceration, mass incarceration and replying to letters from incarcerated individuals in California. And then you also just have like the affinity organizations that, you know, put on events for themselves. So I, mean, I can speak about the Latino Law Students Association because of my obvious involvement, but we even do work with the community outside of Southwestern. So it's not just here, our campus for the last 19 years, our organization has uh, funded a toy drive where we provide toys for every single child at this elementary school that's about two blocks away from Southwestern. It's one of the more lower income schools in LA County. And for some children, that's the only Christmas gift they'll receive that year. And so I think it just kind of exemplifies that when we talk about the Southwestern community, there's so many organizations here that will bring awareness to issues that will highlight issues. You have, you know, and, I think what's really important is that you just don't have students attending these events, but I will see professors, I will see administration, I will see staff and faculty members attending these events too. And then also that it's not just about here at Southwestern, we care about the greater LA community. And so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and to kind of take it one step further as an alumni, you know, I don't know if it's clear on the screen, but I'm an Asian American Pacific Islander. And so, you know, and I was the first in my family to go to law school and coming to Southwestern, it's important because I wanted to be surrounded by people that looked like me, you know, and so that was really helpful because I felt like I was comfortable. I felt like I was in a safe space, but taking that one step further, even graduating, the people you go to law school with are your colleagues. They're going to become your colleagues after school. They're going to be the people that you rely on, that you seek out for advice. Um, and I wanted to be surrounded by like-minded people. And that's what I got at that school. And now with everything going on in the world, we called each other up. You know, we went to protest together. We figured out ways how we could collaborate and we could use our voices and our power that we had to make a difference. And so it was even taken one step further removed. And I and when I got to Southwestern, I was invited to do the skills lab that was um, in the summer before when I'll even started. And that at the time, and I don't know if it's still the same, but it was targeted for people who were first gen and their, you know, their families to go to law school, you know, who were diverse. And it's really important because 
if you're diverse and your your family didn't have this opportunity before, you didn't have this opportunity before, if you look at our history, right, you know, it's just the way it was is that we didn't get those opportunities growing up. Our, our parents, our grandparents, they didn't. So, you know, if you didn't have that education coming through your family, you're kind of at a disadvantage. You know, if you didn't get to grow up in a great socioeconomic area and the school systems that you went to, you know, maybe you didn't get the skills that someone else went, that someone else had. And so I really appreciated getting into that skills class because I felt like I was brought up to speed and I felt like I was set up for success where maybe otherwise I wouldn't have been and I would have struggled more. Um, and I think that that was something really, really great that was specifically targeted for me, but it was so helpful. And I bought in and I felt armored to kind of tackle that first day of law school, not only with skills, but walking into a campus. Like I, I, like I, I said, I'm saying for the third time, I was a student athlete. Like I've always had a built-in group of friends on a team. You know, I've never really had to make friends. This was the first time I really had to make friends that weren't athletes that I didn't have that kinship with. And so to walk into a campus with people that looked like me, I felt comfortable and I felt safe. And I thought that was really, really important. I think that is a wonderful place to uh, leave today's program. Um, I think that was a, a perfect sentiment for what I hear from many of our students about what it's like um, to, to be part of the Southwestern community. Um, so I wanna thank all of our panelists for your uh, taking the time out this morning for your wonderful experiences that you've shared and your advice. I know that um, it was well received. You can see all the messages in the chat if you haven't had a chance yet. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, and thank you to Dean Garkanian for moderating the panel. That was really very, um, very illuminating. So we are going to conclude today's program um, with just a reminder that we do have some additional events coming up for you before the end of this calendar year. I put some of them in the chat. Um, we're gonna have two different spotlights um, featuring a scale alum and a current scale student. They're coming up later this month on the 15th and the 29th. And then on the 22nd, we'll be doing our insider's perspective on um, understanding the CAS report. So the CAS is essentially your LSAT report if you don't know the name yet. So I hope you'll join us for those events. Um, and then just in general, if you know, uh, myself or anyone in the admissions office can be a resource for you. Um, please reach out to us. I also put the link to schedule a meeting if you'd like to meet with somebody from the admissions office to meet with a current student or to meet with one of our professors. Um, please take us up on it. Um, we'd be happy to connect you. Uh, you can certainly come with questions um, or if you just want to you know again get a better feel for Southwestern in a more intimate setting. Um, we welcome you to, to reach out at any time. Uh, I also want to remind everyone that we're going to do a raffle for today's participants. So there'll be um, three raffle prizes. Um, so if you joined at any point today, um, you'll go into the drawing and then we will be in touch with you um, afterwards if you happen to win. So um, thank you again so much everybody for joining and for your wonderful participation and engagement. I hope you got a great sense um, from hearing from Dean Dickerson to Professor Knowlton and then our wonderful esteemed panel of just how tremendous the Southwestern community really is. Um, and I hope you do see yourselves as future bison. Um, and um, again, if any of us can be of any help at any time, please don't hesitate to reach out. So with that, we will say goodbye. Thank you and stay safe and stay well. Take care, everyone. <laughs>